Hello, everyone, and welcome to Functional Fertility, the podcast designed to demystify your hormones, up-level your lifestyle, and supercharge your fertility potential. I'm your host, Dr. Kalia Waddles, and today's episode highlights a fabulous new resource, a newly published book called Getting to Baby, a food-first fertility plan to improve your odds and shorten your time to pregnancy. Joining me today is co-author Judy Simon. Judy is nationally recognized as an expert in nutrition and fertility, providing nutrition counseling for individuals, couples, and families. She specializes in evidence-based nutrition counseling, particularly fertility, PCOS, and disordered eating. Along with reproductive endocrinologist, Dr. Angela Thayer, Judy developed the Food for Fertility program, which is a series of interactive classes offering participants lifestyle counseling in this fabulous supportive group setting. Out of their work together, Judy and Dr. Thayer have recently published a new book called Getting to Baby, which I've had the pleasure of reading, and it's such a great resource for anyone trying to conceive. Welcome to the show, Judy. Thank you so much for inviting me. I love your work. I follow you. And it's it's wonderful to see how, see how you've blossomed and how many people you've helped over the years. So super excited to be invited on your show. I was thinking this morning about when I first met you, and it was at a Seattle Reproductive Medicine Symposium, and I want to say it was maybe 2018. Does that sound right? Sounds about right. It was a few years back. They um, would host an annual um, program, which I loved because I got to meet so many other providers out in the Pacific Northwest and be able to partner with them. So it was just lovely to be able to meet you back then and stay in touch. And stay in touch. And I remember this was such a moment for me because you were giving a lecture on nutrition for PCOS and you were talking about all these dietary changes. And you also talked about using myo inositol. And back then it wasn't it wasn't as popular and it wasn't as common. And I felt like we were really starting to do that in the naturopathic and integrative medicine community. And the fact that you brought that to, you know, a, a room full of reproductive endocrinologists and everybody was so interested and you presented the literature about it. I was like, this is my person. I have so much respect. And it really was, it meant a lot to me that you were incorporating all of these different strategies. So I don't think I ever told you that, but thank you oh. for doing that. Well, thank you. I remember you shouted me out on the early stages of social media back then. I was like, wow, this is great. So we learned so much from each other. And that's why I'm really excited to be able to talk about the book. And hopefully it'll be an amazing resource for all the um, folks that um, that you work with and who listen to you on on your wonderful podcast. Let's talk about this book a little bit because it's very good. I just have been flipping through the pages and going back and bookmarking things. It's it's really approachable and I I appreciate how I think you know that that to make behavior change sustainable, it has to be approachable. You have to be able to take bite-sized pieces. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is I I think we're more likely and motivated to make changes when we understand the why behind it. And you've done such a beautiful job of explaining, this is my recommendation and this is why, and this is how you're actually going to make it happen. And so I really um, am drawn to that approach. And in this book, you talk about three key principles for a a fertility promoting diet. Will you tell our listeners and kind of review those three principles? Yes. And, you know, of course, I I have to give so much credit to Angela Thayer, reproductive endocrinologist, triple board certified. And do you know that she's not only board certified, also in lifestyle medicine, and she is a plant-based chef. She went through that training during, um, so that's what we brought together the science you know, our experience of working with women for the last two decades, and then also the evidence-based research in the culinary medicine. We wanted to take those classes and put it into a book. So you asked me about what are the three principles of what we call a fertility promoting diet. And the first one, and and this is because diet fuels the building box of, of our reproductive system, right? For men and women, I know you're on board with that. But the first is that our recommendations is that um, what we eat, what women and men eat, it really needs to be focused on being anti-inflammatory and higher in fiber. And that benefit amongst others is to create a better uterine environment, to have that healthiest environment for implantation, okay? And uh, the second, and we can get into more detail, 
is um, some focus on being more low glycemic to reduce inflammation and insulin resistance because that has a full body effect, not only on the gametes, right? On the eggs and the sperm, but the entire body. And I would have to say, if you look at the population that's really looking for help in fertility, as you know, the, the two most common reasons are usually PCOS and endometriosis, which are inflammatory conditions, right? Um, age, of course, is another reason we work with a lot of patients, but there's a lot of inflammation. And that's somewhere where lifestyle can make a difference. And then the third one is that the plan is high in antioxidants to strengthen the sperm and egg function because there's so much um, oxidative stress that can go on in our bodies that can have a negative impact on fertility. Um, and so that's why we came up with taking everything that we've been teaching our patients, working with them. Um, and, and I like what you said, it's bite by bite. You know, some people look at the book and they're like, oh, that's a lot of plant food. You know, you want me to eat a lot of vegetables. I eat about one or two a week. And I'm like, it's okay. Let's take you where you at. Let's go step by step. I've seen amazing success with people who don't cook a lot. They put together very basic meals but they decided in their routine, I'm gonna make sure there's some veggies at lunch and dinner. And it's made a difference. It's made a difference in their biomarkers. So I think it's important for your listeners to hear that it's not like you have to make it all the way. Putting some of these steps in can make the biggest difference. And I think um, I'm on the very positive side, you know? So I'll tell women like, hey, what you're eating right now, preconception right now, will reduce your risk of adverse outcomes of pregnancy by 50%. Rather than saying, oh my gosh, look at your metabolic markers. You're going to enlarge your body. You're going to have problems. I really flip it the other way and say, hey, look what you can do. And, and we see great results with this. And that's what we really wanted to put the hopefulness in the book and in the stories with, um, with these three. We can go into more depth if you like, but I know it kind of goes along right with healthy gut biome. Our gut is the key. That's where all that fiber comes in. If you're not eating any plant sources, where are you getting your fiber? What's going on in your gut? We can do so much to help regulate hormones by having more fiber in our diet, right? And there's a lot of fibers to pick from. You know, you don't like oats, that's okay. You can have farro, you can have barley. There's lots of grains, there's lots of fruits, there's lots of vegetables. And so that's why the recipes and the culinary skills are in there. Well, I noticed that about the book. You're talking about chronic inflammation, oxidative mm -hmm. stress, the gut mm -hmm. microbiome, metabolic changes like insulin resistance, and that's functional medicine. That's what I Absolutely. do from a systems biology Absolutely. approach. I felt so aligned with it. And and the beauty of, um, of your book and just your classes that you teach is that these things respond very readily to lifestyle and nutrition changes. They do. They do. And I and I want to tell you that, you know, you know there's a lot of waiting in fertility. Women are waiting to get their period. They're waiting to get the results from a test. They're waiting to do an IVF cycle. There's a lot of waiting. Well, during that waiting in two months, we can see a woman's hemoglobin A1C improve. And they're blown away. They're like, oh my gosh, without medication, with doing some walking, with adding more fiber with adding those positives while they're waiting, they're seeing those metabolic markers improve. And, and I always say, well, how are you feeling? Cause that's what I care about much. You're like, yeah. Yeah, I'm pooping regularly. I'm not constipated anymore. So I think when they can see those changes, it, it takes the pressure off a of weight, which a lot of women get a lot of pressure on, you know, they feel like if I just lose weight and we're like, Oh no, no. And you notice in the book, we talk about, focus on your health outcomes, because just trying to drop weight to have better IVF success is not supported in the literature. You don't want to be in a breakdown mode. You want to be in a nourishing mode and you want to take care of yourself. And honestly, um, I don't know what your listeners will think, but when you're eating a higher fiber diet and having foods like, you know, barley and chia, things with a lot of fiber, it has the same impact as a GLP-1 agonist, right? It slows your gut down. It decreases blood sugar spikes. You know, you feel fuller and you probably will lose weight. I just never guarantee it for anyone. But if they start more movement, improve insulin resistance, eating a more nutrient-dense, high-fiber diet, 
they'll be like, well, I didn't even realize I did lose weight and I'm losing some of that belly fat. Yeah, that's probably going to happen. But I just don't like to put the emphasis on the weight. We like to put the emphasis on the whole health that we're getting them ready, not just for fertility, but a healthy pregnancy. And I'm hoping that's what you found in the book when you read it, like, hey, for right now, your health, and then your forever health. We want your forever health to be good too. So you can be a healthy parent who lives a long time, right? That's exactly right. And maybe this is the time you and I were connecting a little bit that you share a story in the book about uh, just a beloved person to both of us named Ryan, mm -hmm. who you, you shared her story of, you know, fertility struggles. And then she ended up in your in your food for fertility classes and learned so you. many healthy skills. Yes. I sent her your way. I said, I know exactly where you need to go. She learned all these skills, ended up having a pregnancy, has two beautiful, gorgeous, perfect twins mm -hmm. who I love so much. And she's been able to take those skills and translate them into how she takes care of her family. So not Absolutely. only are we learning to take care of our own bodies, but then those healthy habits continue through the generations and how empowering. And they do. And I'm really lucky in my practice that I get to follow so many of those families and they come back for baby number two or baby number two. Sometimes I don't even know that baby number two when you get an email like, <laughs> hey, Judy, I heard about your book. Guess what? We just had our second one. I'm like, Amazing. So you're right. It's the generational impact and knowing that we're helping with healthy babies. But I think you're really, you're right. Whereas functional medicine is really looking for the whys and the course, the deep root and, you know, marrying that with lifestyle medicine, like how can we be realistic and how can we be inclusive? And, and I hope you notice that we really try to talk about global cuisine, right? Because so often you know, um, when you look at the research, people will just say, oh, well, they did a Mediterranean diet or they did a Dutch diet, like it has a name. And I'm like, wait a minute, not all of our patients are living on the borders of Mediterranean countries, right? <laughs> our, our, our patients are, um, my patients are from Southeast Asia, right? And so they're not eating, you know, um, the same type of thing, but all indigenous global cultural food really is plant forward. You know, some heavier in meat than others, depending where they were regionally. But indigenously, if you go back, all those foods have that foundation. And that's why we really try to be global. And I know you asked me like, hey, you call it plant forward. And I think if we use the word plant-based, people would think vegan, you know, strict vegetarian, and yeah. we're not. What we're saying is try to include more plants. When you're looking at your plate, are you seeing color? Are you eating fruits and vegetables? Are you including these foods? And then here's some ideas about how you can work them in. And that's why um, we came up with the idea of, well, present this information, talk about the different foods and all their amazing nutrition benefits. And then um, offer kind of, we call it a six week program. Somebody could take 18 weeks, but just kind of say like, hold my hand a little bit, go through step by step. And that's how we tried to take our classes and bring it into a book. So we really could reach more people. So someone could, you know, buy the book in an area where they don't have a lot of fertility help, where they're just, you know, you know, trying to get help. And honestly, I just sent this book to my OB from 30 years ago, who helped me with my fertility struggles. I don't know what his reaction will be or if he remembers me. I was lost. There was no internet. There were no people out there. You know, reproductive endocrinology has come a long way, you know, over the last 30 years. I felt very, very lonely. Whereas now, I feel like sometimes our patients have too much information and they're overwhelmed. And so when they come to see me or, or see, you know, work with Angela, what we were finding is first we had to first spend the first 10 minutes saying, no, you don't have to cut all this stuff out of your diet. In fact, don't cut out whole grains because they have so many rich nutrients. They have inositols, they have fibers, they have trace mineral. We have data that actually women are more likely to conceive who eat whole grains. And we talked to them about the variety of grains that are available. So yeah, so sometimes we hear like, oh, I failed an IVF cycle. Maybe I didn't try hard enough. I'm like, we're not sure why, but let's take a different approach on food that's more inclusive and often see, you know, really good results after that. 
Yeah. And like you said, there's these pillars of a fertility promoting yes. diet that it's antioxidant rich, lots of phytonutrients, low glycemic impact, you mm. know, healthy fats and plant forward. So that, that a lot of different dietary preferences could fit mm. into those pillars of healthy eating. And I want to bring up this this tool that you've developed called the fertility plate, which is really designed to to help everyone strike this healthy macronutrient balance using a variety of different foods. Will you tell us a little bit about the fertility right. plate and what well, that looks like? I do have to brag that actually um, um, Angela's husband, I'm going to, it's in there, Ben Sanders, who's a physician himself, actually drew it for us. You know, we're very homegrown on this book, right? Wow. And so, you know, there's a lot of plates, you know, dietary guidelines, things like that. And what we were trying to bring out in this fertility plate is we were trying to show food from its origin, you know, like I think a lot of people forget that cauliflower, you know, is actually grown in the ground and they often, you know, buy it already in a cauliflower crust pizza, which is okay, not knocking it, you know what I mean? Like less processed, like where does this food come from? Um, like even the grains, we decided instead of showing pictures of like pasta in, you know, bread out of the package, we would show some wheat to like remind us where is it coming from, right? That there's all these whole grains. So basically the plate was kind of a template or a starting point to put together all these recommendations we were making and say, hey, don't forget those veggies. Maybe even plan some of your meals around seasonal vegetables, you know, that you could, you know, have a sheet pan meal with salmon, but wow, let's do lots of veggies, making that plate half veggies. And then the protein, we wanted to focus on that there's plant sources of protein, lovely ones like edamame, beans, you know, uh, but also eggs have their um, nutrition benefit, excellent source of protein and choline and fish because we have so much good data on um, omega-3s, both from plants and from fish, helping with fertility and grains, and then showing that, yes, fill in with fruits, fats, and dairy. And then we do, you know, put the, you know, not everyone can tolerate dairy. We understand that. There's some great plant-based milks, and we have a whole chapter on that talking about which ones are going to be the most nutrient-dense. So really giving people the idea like, yeah, we're, we're aiming for five or six servings of you know, veggies a day and three or more fruits and having grains and beans and lentils. And for some people, it's like, what do you think about starting with one lentil dish, right? But kind of giving them like, wow, you're going to get that fiber that's going to help support your healthy gut biome, your uterine biome, right? We're learning now that there's a whole biome there and it likes, it benefits from good nutrition too. So, um, some of the women, you know, who might be reading this book, I just want to make sure people don't think like everyone needs to lose weight. Actually, some of our patients, as you know, are really undernourished, no matter what size they are, for whatever reason, whether it's disordered eating, they're a super athlete that doesn't eat enough. And so we still want them to have plant food, but we want to make sure they have enough energy. And so when we go through and we talk about three to six servings of whole grain, some of our more active folks, they need way more grains. They're going to need more on that on that plate. Some of the people not as active, their bodies, you know, are going to do well with a little bit less. So we tried to put that range in, you know, when talking about you just need an ounce of seeds or nuts. Some of you might have more. And, and you shared a listener question with me where the listener said, well, hey, if I'm having, you know, some nuts, ooh, I'm kind of getting a little nervous about the calories, right? Yeah. If, you know, if a serving of nuts is 200 calories, I remember once I had a gal with PCOS and I suggested nuts and, and, and she said, you know, Judy, I've gained some weight. I feel good, but I've gained some weight. And she was eating a cup to a cup and a half of nuts a day. And I said, well, they are new, they are nutrient dense. They're calorically dense, you know, um, Think of those as something that, you know, you're sprinkling on your salad or on your yogurt or you're having a tablespoon or two. You don't want fat to make up the whole diet. So I think on your listener, thinking about the nut butter and the crackers or the whole wheat toast, having one or two tablespoons is probably plenty and making sure you're filling in with a variety of foods too. That was a great question that she asked. It seems like once you have your pantry stocked, once you have your bulk grains, and once you have mm -hmm. the proteins in the your freezer and mm -hmm. you have a rotation mm -hmm. of fresh produce, you're going to be able to make these fertility plates pretty easily with the stuff that you have on hand. Absolutely. And we really encourage um, the women from our classes and in the book 
to really do some pre-planning. You might decide like, hey, it's quinoa week. We're going to have quinoa for dinner. I'm going to make enough that it's going to go in my salad bowls and I'm going to get a few, you know, I'm going to get a few meals out of it. I tend to be the super week person, you know, I'm like, what's the big batch on the weekend? Is it lentil? Is it being this week for me? It's a red lentil carrot soup that I love. And it's going to be part of my main meal. And then it's going to be a bunch of lunches. And then I'm going to freeze one. So, you know, keeping that freezer full of wholesome food, um, we find that uh, people will often eat out less. And when they do eat out, they're a little more particular about what they're choosing. Mm -hmm. They're going to choose a restaurant where they actually have vegetables, that there's more, you know, there's a variety where they can get a nice, fresh, seasonal fish and things like that, you know, with more variety. So I think um, that makes a big difference for people. So we we try to say, hey, these are the key things. The amount you eat is going to vary based on what your body needs. And I'm hoping you got to the part in your book where we do include, and I wish we could include more on intuitive eating and eating competence. Yes. And that's why this book doesn't have calorie plans. And what we encourage women to do, because they have all different things you know, going on in their life, is to feed themselves faithfully, be a competent eater, plan on you need to eat throughout the day to fuel yourself. But know that sometimes you sit down and you're eating a delicious meal and you're about two thirds, three quarters of the way full. It's really good. You're like, you know what? I'm good. I feel good. I think I'm going to wrap this up and save it. And other days you might be like, you know what? I want a little bit more. I need a little something sweet at the end. I'm going to have a little bit of that chocolate or I'm going to have some more berries. So the idea that you are in tune with your own body, do you know what I mean? And I know sometimes people tell me, well, my trainer designed my macros. I go, that's great. And maybe that gives you a little bit of guidance, but you know your body on what on what you're full and what feels satisfying. And, and what I find too is a lot of the women with PCOS wake up not hungry, okay? They maybe drink coffee. They don't eat till two in the afternoon. And then all their food is coming in at night and they're often grabbing really quick, you know, higher glycemic foods because they need quick energy and then in the morning, they don't feel good. And so we found when we were doing our classes live and even virtual, that when women started cooking in the morning and eating this great food, they go, I started cycling. And the only thing different I did was eating, changing the way I ate. And these were women that were waiting for IVF cycles. And they started like having oats and berries and nuts in the morning. And you know, and they just making those changes over six weeks, like, oh my gosh, I got a cycle. Or or they got pregnant before they got their cycle because they ovulated. How is that, right? How are it's really rewarding. It's so rewarding. It's it's just great, which is why we love those stories to give women hope. And men too, we want them to eat healthy, but you know, we really have focused our classes so much on women. And um, I love that you you asked about, um, Angela came up with this, uh, you know, um, the that five components of a simple, delicious salad, right? Yeah, we need to know what these are because so I, yes. salads have a bad reputation that they're boring, they right? That it's they lettuce do. with like ranch dressing right, and some right. carrots. So tell right. us how we can make this more interesting. Boy, Angela came up with this and she's done so much culinary training. She's amazing. And her five things were make sure there's something green, something crunchy, like a crunchy vegetable, like a cucumber, a radish, kohlrabi, fennel. Try something different. Put something yeah. crunchy in your salad. Add a fresh fruit. Adding that sweet to your savory. Add something like if there's berries or strawberries. I love pomegranates. Or if you don't have that, take some dried fruit out of your cupboard. Take some fruit out of the freezer. Let it thaw a little bit. I Top loved cubed fruit. apples in mine. Yes. So good. Apples, berries. We have so many oranges. I always tell my husband, just put some of those baby mandarins, throw it in your salad, mm -hmm. right? We like something sweet, something savory. Maybe you've got some artichoke hearts in the fridge, throw them in there. Some olives, right? Something sour. Put those different flavors, fresh herbs. If you have parsley, cilantro, sometimes it's a little limp, throw it in your salad. It's okay. And then um, crunchy, like putting nuts. I like to put sunflower seeds on my salad. Umami, sometimes a little bit of cheese, nutritional yeast, feta, goat cheese, blue cheese. I also like to put, if it's more of an entree salad, um, some beans or lentils, 
But maybe it's your whole dinner and you're adding beans and chicken or smoked trout or leftover salmon. And so one of the salads that we had, and I have to tell you the story, we put in our massage kale salad with citrus and pomegranate. It's got toasted mm. uh, nuts, and then you can optionally add some goat cheese. We love massage kale salad. And I have to tell you, and I'm going to shout out to my uh, colleague, uh, Andrea Lopriori, who's an amazing sports dietitian and ultra marathoner. I love her. She was doing her training at Bastyr when we did our first class. And part of her assignment was to help me. And I said, okay, Andrea, give me your best kale recipe. She goes, Judy, massage kale salad. Okay, this is a while ago, 14, 15 years ago. I had never massaged kale. She taught me how to do it. And I think we use massage kale salad in like 10 years of classes because the women just massage the kale. They're like, oh, it gets softer. It gets darker, greener. It doesn't taste bitter anymore. You could add strawberries. So we always love massage kale. And I said, it's got to go in the book because that's one of the favorite things our ladies love to do. It's not your boring green salad, right? It's kind of a really fun salad. I, I mean, that's my favorite holiday salad because it's green and put pomegranates in, in it. Pomegranate salad in season, put a different fruit in it. You know, you could do it in the summer, you know, change things around. And I always tell patients, if you got to dinner and you haven't had fruit, throw it in your salad, put it on your plate, make a fruit salad part of the meal, get your fruit in there so you don't, you don't forget it. So think of how many antioxidants are in that salad. Pomegranates, right? Anthocyanins. You've got all your folic acid, all your great kale. We're using olive oil. So you're really getting a nice amount. And then it's yummy if there's any leftover. It's like delicious the next day too. It so saves it. pretty well. It's hearty. Those greens are hearty. And this is they really me are. laugh too. I think I learned... I first started really massaging kale at Bastyr about 15 years ago. And that must I think it was a trend. Insane. Yeah, it was a trend. And although I teach at University of Washington, shout out. And I've had, we had so many interns from both Bastyr and um, University of Washington over the years. And we, we dedicated it to them that really, you know, helped out on the food scene. And we actually, we did, um, Angela and I did a, a cookie class once there. And I hope we do another one because it was super fun to do like a fertility um, uh, cooking class there in their kitchens. But um, yeah, the hands on. And so that's why we tried to make recipes that weren't too difficult, maybe push people to try a new grain. There's quinoa in there, there's farro in there. We tried to take like class favorites. Um, we're doing a cooking class this Saturday virtually. And we're actually using the split pea soup. And some people are like, I don't know if I like peas. I go, try this soup. You could come home and you can make it start to finish in 40 minutes, even faster if you put it in your instant pot, but it's velvety, it's delicious. Secret ingredient, we put miso in at the end for an umami flavor and it's plant-based. And I, I want to make sure, because you asked me about plant forward, we're not saying you have to cut out all your animal products at all. Okay. We're saying try fish. Okay. Um, you know, and fish can be, you know, little packets of tuna that you add to your salad. It could be shrimp, um, you know, uh, try to get fit, you know, small fish like sardines for the omega-3s. Um, definitely try some plant-based meals. But for a lot of people, it's the protein swap. And you might have noticed there's a whole chapter that Angela really brought to life in the book, like, see what it's like to maybe have a little bit less, like a combo. So some of my patients will try like, hey, maybe I'll try a ground turkey, chili with black beans. And if their partner doesn't like beans, you know what they can do? They can puree them and mix them in there. Some people oh, sensory never don't thought like about beans. that. Why not puree it and put in the soup? No shame, no harm. You know, not everybody likes textures. That's yeah. why I'm really into like the red and yellow lentils, you know, that make the dolls and the easy soups. Do you know, you could take cooked red lentils and you could throw them in a smoothie. So the smoothie recipe we have, I'm all about whole food smoothies. Use what you have, right? Use chia seeds, use, you know, oats, use yogurt, your favorite plant-based milk, fruit, nut butters, use what you have. But um, I, I, I learned this from the lentils.org, the lentils organization. You can make a great raspberry smoothie and cooked lentils. Don't put them in raw, please. Cooked lentils, you can put them in your smoothie. You could boost the fiber and the protein with real food. And that's what we're trying to do in this book, show you you can make a smoothie, you can make a fast soup. And most of these meals are all like make at least four servings. So you're planned over. So that's the idea too.
Well, I never would have thought of that. So thank you so much for saying that because it never would have occurred to me. But while we're talking about the proteins, Mm -hmm. my listener, Lacey, wrote in a question that I thought I had to ask you. Lacey said, I see so much conflicting information about eating fish. Is this okay while I'm trying to conceive? Do I need to be worried about mercury and other environmental pollutants? How do you count? That's such a good question. And Mm -hmm. I'm so glad she asked that. So- um, in the state of Washington, we have a great fish guide, and I'm sure you've probably seen it. And it really, it's for, you know, pregnant women and children. Well, our women are trying to get pregnant, so I like to treat them like they're pregnant. And it's really based on your weight, how many ounces of the lower mercury fish. So here in the Pacific Northwest, we're really lucky because we have so much ocean fish, you know, our fresh halibut and salmon. We are very spoiled. We've got great fish with really low mercury. So those fish, you can have much larger quantities of two to three times a week and you're fine. Then there's kind of the group in the middle, like the bottom feeders, like halibut and things where they might say six to eight ounces per week tops. And then there are four fish that are really high in mercury, um, like I think it's shark and tilefish. Um, but there is, and I'll send you the list to put in your show notes yes, please. of the safe guide. And then we also care about sustainability too. And I think that Angela really brings it out in the book. You know, we do talk about, you know, not everyone is as privileged with what they have available in their community or what they can afford. So more plant forward diet is saying, hey, use your, you know, local foods as much as possible. We'd rather you buy local carrots Maybe they're not organic, but they've been grown locally. Wash them off. You'll get rid of pesticides. Then maybe spending three times as much for produce coming from South America in the winter, it's going to lose a lot of nutrients. It's okay to use frozen veggies. If you use canned, rinse them off. We do have a whole section on fertility boosters and disruptors where we do talk about endocrine disruptors and to try to reduce exposure to things like bisphenol A and phthalates. Um, So yeah, if you have a choice, I would love you to cook your beans from scratch, but if that is impractical, you know, wash what you have. So we really want to be sensitive, like we're not writing a book for privileged people could afford to buy all things at a co-op. We want to be realistic that wherever anybody lives and on their budget, that they can have healthy food. And when you do cut back some on how much meat you eat, you do save a lot of money that you can use more on produce. Because sometimes, you know, produce out of season, it's expensive. So shopping more seasonally is is definitely the way to go. And at least in the Pacific Northwest, half the year we have access to um, farmer's markets where we can really try to emphasize and I mean, what tastes better than a carrot, you know, from the farmer's market, right? What what a Nothing. difference in flavor. And people want to eat vegetables when they taste good. Because I, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of patients and they'll be like, yeah, we're really not that crazy about vegetables. And you're like starting from square one. So you really want to work with them. And so that's why we're hoping we put so many culinary tips like, hey, what about seasoning? What about, you know, when you roast something, you caramelize it, you know, um, it has a different flavor. We've made some bowls. We have, um, I think, a recipe in the book with like, I think it's either winter or acorn squash with stuffed with farro. And people eat that. They're like, oh, my God, I love farro and squash. I would have never thought of that combination. So you have to make vegetables exciting, delicious, accessible. And then all the nutrition follows because people always feel better. You know, unless, you know, there's a few with IBS who have to be a little picky and careful. And there are some people I know that they're like, whoa, their limit for onion and garlic is a little lower. And that's where they might need some one-on-one help. And that's great. We, you know, there's dietitians, naturopaths who can definitely help with that with tummy insensitivities. Mm -hmm. But if you look at our gals with PCOS, endometriosis, and IBS, almost always adding more fiber in their diet with things that are comfortable for them we see great benefits and they're like, oh my God, feels better. And feels when your gut better. feels better, you feel better. And you're going to be more likely to do those health, healthy behaviors that, you know, we're really striving for and, um, you know, less ultra process, but we're not saying never, you know, we all have our little favorite things that I would never say don't eat them. Um, and honestly, it's better to say it's okay to have those things sometimes because when you make something forbidden, you're a mom, you know what happens. If something's forbidden, more. 
They want more. So if you say, yeah, we have this sometimes. We don't have it in the cupboard all the time. You know, these are some treats or on holidays and special things. Um, they'll probably appreciate what you make homemade with them and really love them, you know. Uh, we used to do a, a recipe. It's not in the book, but people loved it. We made black bean brownies. And I used to make it around Valentine's when we had a February class. And and you can do it with garbanzos or black beans, but you can actually puree brownies and you can make a flourless product. So it's great for people that are gluten-free. You know, you don't have to use any of those fake flowers or anything. Um, it's still going to have some sugar, but it had cocoa. It had beans in it, right? So, and they're delicious. So like really yummy. They're and delicious. people are doing blonde brownies with garbanzo beans and they're really good. And we're not hiding anything. We're just saying nope. there's different ways you know, to make things and, and try them out and see what tastes good to you. I have to tell you, I used to teach the five to seven year old cooking class at the Ooh, YMCA. I love it. And so in the in the afternoons, these little kids would come and we would cook recipes and we made black bean brownies one week. Fun, and you know, right? the parents would come at the end and we'd have this whole thing where the kids would serve the parents the foods that they made. Mm -hmm. And the parents were shocked that the kids made the black bean brownies and they loved them. They were eating them. And then they all took their recipe home and they were so surprised at how much they enjoyed them. And they never would have made them if we hadn't done it in class. Right. And so early exposure, and you'd be surprised that makes a big difference because the women we're working with, their culinary skills are all over the place. Some are, and I do want to say that even if someone doesn't cook, like they are absolutely like, Judy, we're going to be ordering out or we're going to go to our local grocery gourmet store and buy food. Um, I work with them on how can you add in those foods based on where you go. And um, I just shared an IG from a, a patient where she said, Judy, this is IG shareable. But when I saw you last August, you know, my doctors were pushing me to do IVF. We did all these IUIs. And she, you didn't judge me. You just said, let's work together and how we could round out what you were eating. And I'm, I'm telling you, they don't eat anything at home, three meals out. And we came up with ideas and she goes, I'm 17 weeks pregnant. I'm doing oh. great. I conceive naturally. And she was now in the second half of pregnancy where I'm feeling better and I'm hungrier. I need some more help. And they're still eating out and she's healthy. So I really want people to know that even if they see this and they're like, okay, I'll try a few things that um, we never want to be judgmental. We, you know, may, you know, there's home delivery services in our area where people can actually order wonderful food. Some people start with, you know, some of the meal delivery services um, that are farm fresh that we have in our area. Mm -hmm. And that's a stepping stone you know, to help people to get to a place. And then they're going to have a healthy pregnancy, you know, and that's right. what we want to see with these folks. That's what we want to see. And you've talked about all of these different, um, the the key principles. And I want to go back to and talk about one of them, which is that um, it's a low glycemic impact. That's mm -hmm. what you talked about in the book. And yeah. can you just walk us through, how do you help your patients to identify problems with their glucose metabolism? If anybody is listening and they're like, is my blood glucose okay? How do I find out? What do I do? Well, yeah, and that's really important. And if uh, if I'm working with a fertility patient one-on-one -on -one and they haven't had labs, whether they're working with a whoever their PCP is, a naturopath or their OBG, whoever, however they come to me. And a lot of times they're like, I haven't had labs in years. I'll talk to them about, you know, and they're not having regular cycles or not conceiving, you know, get all your basics like you talk about on your show, get your comprehensive medical panel. We want to know if there's anything going on in your liver. We want to know what your hemoglobin A1C is. But sometimes, Clea, even with all that data, right, you'll see a woman, maybe she has PCOS or inovitory cycles, her hemoglobin A1C looks normal. Her fasting blood sugar is normal. But when you do your intake and you listen to them and they tell you when they're crashing, they tell you they're tired, they tell you then all of a sudden it hits them and they're starving, you can almost tell that there's probably some insulin resistance, right? And for some patients, depending on, you know, what their needs and their access is, you know, I may have them, you know, get that fasting insulin, do the HOMA IR, or um, some of our providers at, at UW will actually do a two-hour insulin glucose test. I see thinner women with auditory disorders who have 
insulin resistance. Like nobody can believe it. And they've got visceral fat. And usually they have PCOS with that picture. But the point is, so they can all benefit. So you said, what are the points that I would do is first of all, I want to make sure they're nourishing themselves throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Not just for four hours or certain windows, they're nourishing themselves throughout the day. They're nourishing their exercise, they're nourishing their activity, and there's balance. They've got their carb, protein, fat. They're not just, you know, they won't get electrified if they just eat a carb. You know, it's not the end of the world. But when they're grabbing that fruit and they think about having nuts or a protein with it, but fiber, having fiber throughout the day, I always tell them, let's aim for that 25 grams of fiber. There's a reason the DRI recommends it. That's what you need for gut health. We have that data for everybody needs that. So if they do simple things like, okay, I can try for oats in the morning, you know, maybe I'll do an egg, maybe I'll use soy milk with it, and I'll do a half a cup or a cup of raspberries. And then what, what can we build in? And then when they come back and we work with them, you really found like, I'm feeling so much more balanced. Like, what is the feedback that we're, that we're getting? So with the low glycemic index, what we're, what the lower glycemic index to reduce inflammation, we're encouraging, you know, um, less reliance on added sugars. Because so many people drink coffee drinks in the morning because they want energy. And honestly, you know, it's like grandes and ventes and six shots of syrup. And I don't think most of us would normally pour ourselves 24 ounces of milk. Would we ever do that at home? But we'd buy a 20, you know, we'd buy a vente latte. Do you know what I mean? With sugar and suck on that. And of course, we're not hungry for lunch and no fiber, a lot of sugar. Do you know what I mean? And so you can do things like cut down the size maybe have one pump because it's a lot. It's a lot when people are weaning themselves on a lot right. of sugar. So, you know, I always say if you reduce your added sugar, right, because eating a piece of fruit is an added sugar, but you're probably going to do better glycemic index wise if there's more fiber with it, you know, so having it with the seeds and nuts and, and things like that too. So really the balance throughout the day is super important that you're trying to choose more whole grains, you know, things like the farro and the quinoa and the black rice and, and different things, more lentils and beans and um, doing that consistently. And then movement. I mean, movement is the partner with nutrition. It'd be five minutes of movement after, um, after each meal. I, I work with women in really large bodies. I'm, I'm saying, you know, over 400 pounds, you know, and women who they're not cycling, we take the smallest changes. Maybe they get up to 20 minutes of movement of their choice. They make changes in what they're eating. And they, they tell me they feel so much, they're no longer fatigued. Well, how can you ask a fatigued person? And oh, I left out the important lab of vitamin D here in the Northwest yes. and for fertility. People are, these women come in with their head on the tables when they have like heavy periods. And I find out their vitamin D is single digit. They often have their anemic, low ferritin because they have really heavy periods when they do bleed. And so really getting those underlying. And that's where I have to say I'm very biased towards healthcare professionals like you and I and doctors, because a lot of people are coaching and they can't provide that medical piece, right? I can't look in your uterus. Yes, but I can refer you to people who can, right? Do you know what I mean? You need that team that's really going to look for everything in your particular case. And you you need to be able to, to work with those people. So, you know, a lot of my patients, they haven't had a physical exam. They're going like right to fertility. I'm like, wait, stop a minute. Let's check into your health. So the glycemic index, I think it that's a really big thing. But like I said, your labs can look pretty good and you can still have insulin resistance. So I always tell my women with PCOS, once they get a diagnosis, at least 75% of you have some degree of insulin resistance. So we're just going to assume you have it. And that's where bringing in, I tell women that, yes, we have a supplement, inositols, myo and dechironositol, but guess what? You get it from your food too. You get it from soba noodles. You get it from beans and nuts. And white beans are this, I think it's white beans. I looked it up, are the single food highest in inositols. So yeah, I recommend, you know, um, inositol supplementation for my patients with it. And I tell them how to take it and the best ones. But I also say, guess what? You can get it from food and they're blown away. I'm like, oh, you know what? You know, folic acid, it comes from food. You know, it, you know what I mean? The, the nutrient itself. So what we're saying is if you do the food first, 
we can take care of so much. Like a lot of people are taking all these magnesium supplements. I'm like, you know, seeds, not so great. You're going to get magnesium too. And you're probably going to feel better. And that's why you go to the bathroom better. And for the guys, I really tell them to, if you can get your partner, if they have a male partner, handful of seeds and nuts a day, some fish, some vitamin D, you've probably improved their semen analysis because we do have randomized controlled studies. The, the nut study that just said, eat have men eat 60 grams of nuts for 14 weeks, they see improved semen parameters. We don't have the live birth data, but we have the improved. Well, their health is ref reflected in their sperm. So I always say, bring the guy to the session, you know, bring, you know, include them. Everything in this book is fine for all genders, right? Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of patients that are using, you know, surrogates or donor egg or same gender couples. There's a lot of ways to make babies. And we want everyone who's in the picture, who's bringing the gametes, who's a carrier. I work with surrogates a lot um, because we want the surrogate to be healthy. Just because she's young and she's had babies doesn't mean she's at her optimal health. Yeah. A lot of times us working with surrogates can really promote health. So hopefully... I think what we're offering, I really believe, um, and every time I reread it, because now it's a book coming out on April 9th, I'm so excited that people can pre-order. Um, I'm really, really excited that um, it's a length that I think if people are interested in it, they can flip through and they might look at three chapters and learn about the fertility-friendly fats and they might learn about, oh, fertility distractors, maybe you know, THC and cannabis is not the best thing for my sperm, you know, or how much alcohol is okay. And, um, you know, Dr. Thar did a great job on really giving us the science and just to the point, not pontificating. Here's what we know right now. If you're trying to optimize your fertility, you may, you know, want to decrease your exposure to these things. And you mm -hmm. want to increase, you know, I always tell people there's no bad side effects of eating a healthier diet. That's exactly right. And I think I find an opportunity to say this in every single episode, but this it's very relevant right now. The things we do to improve our fertility and in this mm. conversation, we're talking about nutrition specifically, it mm. doesn't just restore ovulation. It also reduces our risk for chronic disease like diabetes, cognitive decline, mm -hmm. cancer, osteoporosis, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just about fertility. There are these far reaching benefits that affect absolutely. the health of us and our families and our community. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And what's really exciting is I'm like working with a couple right now and, and they have a one-year-old and they're getting ready to do their second um, embryo transfer. And, you know, the patient said to me, look what my hemoglobin A1C is. It's the lowest it's ever been because she had such a healthy pregnancy and all the habits and things that she did, you know, nursed her baby, still nursing her baby, eating well, walking with a busy life. But mm -hmm. she's like, this is what helped me to have a successful pregnancy and I'm healthier. This is good. And and I really want I really want to bring out to your listeners that we really believe in weight inclusivity. No matter what your weight is, you can reach your optimal health. And if you ever get fat shamed by any provider, you just stop them and say, hey, don't tell me to lose weight. Maybe I've already lost it. Here's what I am doing treat me like you would treat any other patient going through fertility. Look at me as an individual, you know, listen to me. Do, do you know what I eat? I probably eat better than you, you know, maybe to their doctor, whatever. I mean, I think that's really, really important. And I really advocate for that in obstetrical care, prenatal care, postpartum fertility. And we see people really doing well. And that's why we try to include some of those stories in our book to give people hope. So they, they come for help. Some, some women won't go for help if they feel like they're going to be judged about their weight and the scale. They're like, that doctor's just going to tell me I'm too fat to get pregnant. Well, we want to partner with people and say, how are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. What's the best thing in your scenario, in your, in your case? So I had to bring that up. Sorry. Hope yeah. Okay. Very important point. Uh, Judy, as we come to the close of our episode, I'm just thinking about all the work that you put in and your blood, sweat and tears and your heart that you put into this book. And when you think about the book being published and you see that on the shelf, knowing that all of these women and couples and families are going to have access to this, what does that mean to you? It means so much to Angela and I. I can't believe it. Like we would be at conferences where they would talk about nutrition, even if we weren't the speakers, right? 
And someone raised their hand like, well, I need a great resource to tell, to give to my patients. It was like a doctor in Alaska. What can I give them? We have a lot. And I want them to say, get this book. It's affordable. It's an audio going to be in Kindle, you know, on your tablet and in your book. And it's really something. And that's what makes us feel really good. Like Ryan's story, if that helps another mama to be, how great is that? These women were so excited to give their stories. They mm -hmm. were so excited. We have more, but it, it feels great. I feel like it's the capstone of my career. You know, Angela and I have been in this field for, for decades She's an amazing writer and researcher and chef, and we're both foodies. So bringing it all together, it, it's just the best, you know, and I'm just so excited to partner with an amazing practitioner like you, because, you know, we, we really, um, you really get to the core of how to be a healthy person. And that's why I love, 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 you know, your advice. You're on my list of podcasts my patients should be listening to. So I really appreciate all of that. It's great. Well, we're so proud. I feel so fortunate to have both you and Dr. Thayer in my local fertility yes, community. Yes. It's really, we're so fortunate to have this network mm -hmm. and I'm so proud of this book that you've put out and I can't thank wait you. to share it with the audience. And I want to thank all of our listeners for submitting questions for today's episode, for tuning in and for trusting us with your fertility journey to our show's producer, Paola Martini. Thank you so much for bringing the show to life. And Judy, so much gratitude for sharing your insights and your clinical experience and big congratulations on the new book. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. See you next time. Did you love this episode and want to hear more? Head over to drkaliawaddles.com slash podcast where you can find more episodes on all things fertility.